Would you turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 9? Hebrews chapter 9. We've been going, remember that a long time ago. It seems like a lifetime ago. We were going through the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. And the whole point of Hebrews is that this is the second and third generation Christians from the Holy Land. From the, they saw Jesus probably before they were Christian. They heard him speak. They heard the apostles. They saw what happened. And it's not only them, but their children and their children's children. But by the third generation, many of them are tempted to go back to the, what, what did they have to go back to? The, the Judaism, um, the Judaism that led up to Christ, which is the temple, and which is basically the three pillars of Judaism of the first century. It was uh, the angels, and then Moses, and then the temple, and, and the, all the apparatus there. And he talked about how Christ is great, superior to angels. Why would you go back to angels when you have Christ? Which angel did God ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies my footstool? Or did God ever call any one of the angels God like he did Jesus in the Psalms? Thou, O God, has created the heavens and the earth. They are the work of thy hands. They shall all perish, but you remain. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. He quotes the Psalms and shows Jesus is God. And he's no angel, he's God. Why would you go from angels, uh, go from God back to angels? And then the other thing is Moses. Moses uh, built a house, a temple. It was according to the pattern of God. Uh, but Jesus himself built a house. He's building a house. The church is the house. Moses' house is made of badger skins, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, cedar. Jesus' house is made of people. Okay. The Moses' house was destroyed three times. The tabernacle was destroyed once, then Solomon's temple was destroyed, and then Herod actually remodeled the temple. That was destroyed, raised to the ground. Jesus' temple will never be destroyed. He said, destroy this temple, I'll build it up again in three days. Satan's been trying to destroy the church for centuries. He's still doing it, trying to do it all over the Muslim world, all over the world. It will never be destroyed. This is the house that Jesus built, and you are stones in it, thank the Lord. And, you know, Moses' house, you had to go to Jerusalem to go there. And so from the ends of the earth, you had to make your way to Jerusalem to have an encounter with God. Jesus' house is decentralized. Anywhere two or more gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of thee. God is never far away from anybody. Church is important. Look around you, you see the 19, 20 people, so what? No, this is awesome, okay? We came tonight on Wednesday night on the promise of Jesus where two or more gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of thee. We gathered around our brother, laid hands on him, in the name of Jesus, that's Jesus commissioning him, sending him out. Jesus' promise, Jesus' word. Look, why would you go from this house back to that house? So that's the third thing, you know, the, the temple apparatus and everything. Well, I'll tell you one more reason why you go from this house back to that house. Because if you look at this house from a worldly standpoint, it's not all that impressive. Here we are in a half-empty room on Wednesday night. Okay. But... You go to the other house and it is magnificent. Massive stones. You smell meat as soon as you come near it because they're constantly offering sacrifices of bulls, lambs, goats. Priests with official uniforms. I mean, it is an experience. You go through these beautifully embroidered curtains and you hear these prayers and your psalms and hymns. And this is respectable religion. It's got a very old pedigree. It goes back to Solomon and even uh, Moses and the tabernacle. And, and, then, and then you go back to the basement with 15 Christians, most of whom are being persecuted. Some have been fired from their work. Some of them have been in prison. Some of them have been killed for becoming Christian. You think, well, which one do I want to go with? Well, if you're spiritual, you'll go with the Christians. If you're carnal, you'll go with the, the physical house. This is the way re really it is today, okay? That's what, that was the, the way it was for me when I left the Catholic Church. The first time I walked into a Pentecostal church, I thought, this place is fake. There's no, no, no statues, no stained glass, no nothing here. This is phony, okay? Because I was carnal. I was looking for something official. But the problem is this is spiritual. It's no good if there's no faith. It's nothing unless there's faith. 
But where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now here's another thing about Hebrews, and I've repeated this so many times, but it's been so many weeks since I've been here, I'll do it again. These people are getting ready to go back to the temple. To do that, you have to renounce Christ, basically. Because the whole point of leaving the temple is to say Christ is the final sacrifice. So what are you saying when you go back to the sacrificial system? Okay. And furthermore, little did they know, Hebrews is written about 66 AD. Within four years, that temple that they were going to go back to would be destroyed utterly. The sentence had already been passed. God had already decreed. Jesus had predicted it. That temple was doomed. Okay. Now, there's a lesson there for all people of all times. Many people want to go back. Many people want to defect to the world. And they don't realize that the thing that you're going to go back and defect to is already, the sentence has been passed. The doom is already set. The world is under judgment by God. Now, let's talk about the last part of it. That's where he gets into the most detail. He, the, the third pillar of Judaism, the temple, priesthood, and sacrifice. And first we talk about the temple itself. Now, let me read this, this passage and then comment on it. But then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now, worldly, there is not a um, moral judgment. It's just saying it's earthly. The earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, which is a tent. The first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Okay, let me stop right here. He's telling them what they're familiar with. This is what the temple was like. A rectangular building with an open courtyard. Inside was a tent, and inside that tent was a tent. Okay. Now, you go in the building in one way. It was called the way, in fact. You find a huge bronze altar, and there's where sacrifices were offered for the sins of the people. You, everyone who goes in the building goes, that, that's how you go to worship. You go past that altar, you smell that sacrifice. If you're a man, or if you're a Gentile, you can only go so far, then you got to stop. If you're a Jew, you can go a little farther, okay? If you're a Jewish woman, you have to stop. And then the Jewish man can go a little farther, closer to God, basically, to make their prayers. And then the tents are off limits to everybody except priests. Okay, the priests would go into the outer tent, and then one priest, only once a year, can go into the inner tent, which we call the Holy of Holies. A lot of our songs deal with this. Take me past the outer court into the holy place, past the brazen altar, I want to see your face. It's a description of the tabernacle system of worship, or the temple system of worship. Okay, in the, in the first tent, which is called the sanctuary, very sparse, sparse furniture, okay? Three pieces of furniture. You got the big candelabra, massive oil-fed candelabra that was shine light. There was no natural light, no windows, it was all supernatural light. Candelabra, and then you have on the other side of the room a, a table with 12 loaves of bread baked fresh once a week and then changed once a week. That's called the show bread or the bread of God's face. And then in the middle of the room, right at the back curtain facing the other tent, is a little altar called the altar of incense. Okay, now no one can see that except priests. You go past that curtain, the priest goes in, the light shines on the bread, and the incense altar stands there right in front of the curtain that separates you from the very throne of God. Now if you go past that other curtain, 
There's one piece of furniture, a two by four box covered in gold with a massive lid and an engraven uh, angels on each side, their wings almost touching, the cherubim, and the, in between, that's the very throne of God on earth, on that lid. Okay, that's the very throne of God. But then he tells us something else. He says, you want, you want to know what's in that box? He can t- take us and show us what's in the box. Because it was revealed in the Old Testament. One time, when they had the manna, the Lord of commanded in the book of Exodus, take a pot of that manna and put it in the box. Second time, they had a rebellion over leadership. Certain people want to be leader, and, 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 and they were grumbling against Moses and Aaron. They're going, we're full of the Holy Ghost too. We're full of the Spirit. And Moses just cried out to God, show who the real leader is. So God said, everyone get their staff, put it before me overnight. And Aaron's staff budded with almond blossoms overnight. That's how God indicated he was the one. God said, take that rod and put it in the box. And then the second copy, because remember Moses broke the first. The second copy of the Ten Commandments. God said, take that second copy, which I wrote with my own finger, put it in the box. Okay, so that's what was in the box. You've got Aaron's rod, you've got a pot of manna, and you've got the Ten Commandments. Okay, now, that's called the, the Ark of the Testimony, but the testimony's not for you, it's against you. Okay. Aaron's rod is against man, because it reminds us all that we have a tendency to rebel against God-appointed leadership, right? And the pot of manna is a testimony against the people because God provided manna and they complained about it. They want to quail, okay? We don't, we're not content with what God gives us. And then, of course, you know the law, the copy of the law. That's a big condemnation because, in truth, we've broken all of them spiritually, so that's what's in the box. But thank the Lord that the box has a lid. <laughs> the most expensive part of the whole tabernacle. The most expensive part of the temple. Solid gold lid with solid gold angels over it. And in between the angels is where God sits. And God has said, uh, he called that lid the mercy seat and said, uh, I will, there is where I'll meet you at the mercy seat. Because what happened in this whole chapter presupposes the Day of Atonement, the feast called the Day of Atonement, the priest goes in once a year and sprinkles blood right on that seat. Okay, and basically what that is is an indication that a transaction has occurred that has satisfied divine justice. Some innocent being has died for the sins of the people. Therefore, it's called also a covering. It covers the sin for a year. And there's this little cer- ceremony where the worshipers gather outside the tent with bated breath because they want to see the priest emerge. And when they see the high priest emerge, he comes out with a blessing. Your sins are forgiven for another year. And then they, it's like, oh, hallelujah, you know. Some of these psalms are written, you know, celebrating this. It's really beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful liturgy, beautiful services that they had that were teaching. And, and this is what the people wanted to go back to. This is a, this is a really uh, powerful thing. But he, he brings up a couple of points about it. Number one, he says it, there, it's a worldly sanctuary. It's carnal. It's not spiritual. And therefore, it's temporal. It's temporary. Okay. The tabernacle was destroyed back in the, when the Philistines destroyed it. The ark was actually captured in battle. It's an amazing story. The throne of God on earth. And God was sitting on the throne. He allowed himself to be captured. Incredible story. Okay. The, uh, the, 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 the temple that Solomon dedicated, when he dedicated it, the priests were there all in their holy array. Choirs and choirs of priests. Musical instruments. Fantastic. And when the time came for God to take his rest, is what the, the, is what the scripture says. God took his rest. The glory of God filled the temple and they couldn't even stand up. Everyone was prostrated for who knows how long. As God came into the temple, you couldn't see him. All you could see is a cloud. 
If you would have seen him, you would have died. Okay. But Ezekiel saw that the sins of the people were so bad that in his vision, he saw the glory leave the tabernacle, the tent. And he saw the glory leave the whole temple. It hovered over the temple for a few days. And then it actually came to rest on the Mount of Olives. And then shortly after that, it ascended to heaven. Okay, that's Ezekiel's vision. And you know, Jesus walked into the temple in Matthew 23 and gave his last official speech to the Jewish people. And one of the things he said is, your house is empty. In other words, God doesn't, isn't going to live here anymore. And then he left. Oh, he said, you won't see me again until you, you know, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then he left the temple. You know where he went? Mount of Olives. A few days later, he ascended to heaven from where? The Mount of Olives. All right. Look, this is a carnal sanctuary. It's only temporary. It was, the temple was destroyed twice. Once by the Babylonians, once by the Romans. Ironically, on the same calendar day. Tishba, the ninth of the month of Av. And he, 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 you, got this, you, you got this candlestick. Well, what does it represent? The light of God. You go into the tent, but not everyone can go in the tent. But the light of God is shining on the bread. What's the bread represent? The word of God. Why would you go in the tent with the light of God shining on the word of God? That's the way to fellowship with God. You got this beautiful little altar, a golden altar, two by two, for, with coals on it and a sacred recipe for incense. And you, the priest puts the incense on the coals as he says his prayers. Okay. And those, those are not just his prayers, those are the prayers of Israel. So as he says it's the prayers of Israel, he puts the incense on the coals. Why does he put the incense on the coals? The Lord will not receive the prayers of fallen, sinful human beings unless they are mingled with what God calls a sweet-smelling savor. Okay. Now, that is beautiful, but carnal. Okay. Carnal. We sit here tonight because we're born again with the light of God. We need no candelabra. We sit, you got in your lap the bread. The bread that came down from heaven. The bread that allows communion with God. If you neglect it, that's on you. You can have communion with God. Incredible. You stand there and you say something like this, or even if you don't say something like this, if you mean it in your heart, Father, in the name of Jesus, all of a sudden your prayers smell better. They're acceptable. In spite of your flaws. You know how flawed we are even in the best of our prayers? But every last one of them, not one of them will fall to the ground if they're offered in faith in the name of Jesus because his life is the incense of savor that the Lord loves. You see what I'm saying? And so uh, he says that, you know, you have these three testimonies against you. And there's a story in Samuel how after the ark was captured, the Philistines sent, sent it back. And the people gathered around. They got curious. Man, I always wondered what was in that box. And they lifted the lid. And like 70,000 of them were killed in one day. Right there. Why? Well, you lift that lid. Now, now there's nothing between you and the law you broke. The leadership that you constantly rebel against. And the provision that you complain about. <laughs> Nothing between you. So they lift the lid and 70,000 die. Thank the Lord for the lid. The priest goes and sprinkles the blood on the lid. And now your sins are covered. As it says in Psalm 130, If you should mark iniquity, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness that you might be feared. Okay. But we don't, you know... That box has disappeared. It's, I know where it's at. You read about people like archaeologists say it's under the Temple Mount, or some people thought it was in Ethiopia because they've got a tabernacle just like this down there. The Ethiopians have had it for centuries. 
That's not where it is. It, it was taken to heaven. God put it in heaven. It's, he says in the Revelation, the heavens rolled up back like a scroll. I saw the Ark of the Covenant. It's there. You, you don't, you, you see, you don't need the Ark of the Covenant. You got something called the throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. There we obtain grace and find mercy to help in the, in the time of need. And when these things were thus ordained, verse 6, the priests always went into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. So priests would do the services week after week, day after day, holiday after holiday. And they did have liturgies of beautiful, beautiful services, fantastic services. And uh, re really wonderful to behold and wonderful to see how they teach us about Christ, okay? And a lot of the psalms are, are liturgical psalms that go along with some of those services. And, you know, every, every Sabbath day they would change the bread. Remember the story where David's running for his life and he stops in the temple and he's starving and famished and they say, well, all we have here is the bread. But that was sacred bread. You're not supposed to eat that. It's only for priests, you know. But David said, I'm going to die. So they went and got the bread and gave, it, gave him the bread. And Jesus referred to that when the Pharisees were saying, hey, you're picking grain on the Sabbath. He said, don't you remember David? Hey, you know, um, once a week they change out that bread and once a week they come in and trim those, those lamps, wicks, change the oil. Never let the lamps go out. And verse 7, the second went into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Notice that the, the numbers wear down. Throngs come into the temple past the brazen altar. But the Gentiles stop here. The Jewish women stop here. The Jewish men stop here. The priests go into the tent, but then they stop. It just keeps getting reduced. And down at the end, one man is qualified only once a year to directly go into the presence of God. And everyone waits outside with bated breath. Let the transaction be done. It says on the Day of Atonement that the priest would offer a sacrifice for everybody, but it would only apply to those who afflicted their souls. Did you know that? See, Christ died for everybody. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. But it only applies to people who afflict their souls. Say, my God, I'm a sinner. Okay. It all reduces down to one. What's, he, what's this mean? Oh, the, the curtains outside of the holiest of holies? They were embroidered with the cherubim. Remember the cherubim in the Garden of Eden? This is Adam and Eve said, Hey, I know we ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now we're sinners, but let's eat the tree of life and see what happens. And God said, Don't let them do that. Why? Had they eaten of the tree of life in the state of fallenness, they would have been fixed, fallen forever. So the Lord drove them out of the garden and set up cherubim as holy awesome guardians to keep them out of the garden. Special kind of angel, a living fearsome being with four faces, a flaming sword, kept them out of the garden. And then he had those cherubim woven into the, t the tapestry of the curtain, separating everyone from God. Now, he's saying in verse 8, the Holy Ghost is signifying by this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. See, they want to go back, and he's saying, wait a minute. The whole thing is a testament that we haven't found the way to get back to God. This is too limited. Not everyone can even come close. And even the priest can't really go in there. And even the one man, he can only do that for about an hour, then he's got to get out of there. No, we haven't found the way back to God, but what happened on the cross? And they knew it. What happened in the temple on the cross is a huge sign. That big curtain that separated the priests from the presence of God was torn from top to bottom. Can you imagine a Jewish priest ministering in the sanctuary and all of a sudden, rip! I'm telling you, if that didn't turn you to Christ, I don't know what would. 
which was a figure, he says, for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Okay, here's another problem, okay? All these blood of bulls, that was ordained by God. Bulls for the priest. Bull, a bull for each nation every day. Israel offered 70 bulls a day for all the nations of the world. They were intercessory prayer people. A bull for the priest on the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, he went and got a bull for his own sins. And because he's a priest, that the bull symbolizes some aspect of Christ. The strong bore the, the burden for the weak. A bull can do what we can't do. Christ can do what we can't do. The strong man bore the burden for everyone. Well, the priest is going to bear the burden for the whole nation, okay? So he gets a bull for himself and his sins. And then he gets two goats. One goat. Oh, they choose, they choose between the two goats by lot. One goat is going to die, and the other is going to have the sins confessed on him, and he'll be sent out in the wilderness. And so each typifies something of Christ. Christ died for our sins. And Christ, as Isaiah 53 says, took up our sins and carried them away. They put, they, they, the priest confessed the, the sins of the nation on the head of what they call the scapegoat. And that's what we call it to this day, right? You guys heard of scapegoat? That comes from Leviticus. And he's, then, they, then they let the goat out into the desert, knowing that goat is going to bear the, the sins of the people and eventually die. That goat is doomed, okay. Well, one year, what happened, and this was in their, their time of tremendous apostasy, the scapegoat came back in the city of Jerusalem. The reason they knew it is because they had a special sash that they tied around his neck to lead it out. It was a, it was a scarlet sash and supposedly every time the high priest of Israel accomplished the Day of Atonement, that scarlet would turn white. Though so your sins are scarlet, they would be white as snow. And there was weird things happening after Christ was, uh, after Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. This is not Christians reporting this, this is his enemies. The Jewish rabbis said, for the 40 years leading up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, that sash never turned white again. Okay, in other words, scapegoat offering couldn't work for them anymore because they already had a scapegoat, all right. But when, they, when the, the, the one year when the scapegoat came back into Jerusalem with sash around, it freaked everyone out. I mean, you can imagine everyone trying to get away from the scapegoat. And so they came up with a new thing. We're not taking any chances. We'll take this goat out in the wilderness and throw it over a cliff. Okay, <laughs> that's what they were doing. Okay, think about what happened when Jesus gave his first sermon in Nazareth. What they tried to do. They took him out and they wanted to throw him over a cliff. See, Jesus is in all this, but the problem with it is, it's just type. It's just shadow. Okay. Why would you leave the real for the type? See what I'm saying? Jesus is in all of it, okay? He, and, and, and he said, look, the problem is it's that it, since it's every single year, it can't cleanse your conscience. Why? Because it's only covered. You know, sin is not covered in the New Testament. Thank you, Jesus. It's not covered. It's removed. The difference between covered and removed is eternal. Okay? Every year they've covered again. And every year the people breathe a sigh of relief. Thank you. He won't hold our sins against us. But then every year the next year they hope that the, the sash turns scar uh, white. And they breathe a sigh of relief and the priest reemerges. And, 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 and yet... The fact that it's endless, week after week, they go in, change the bread, go in and trim the wicks, go in and make the sacrifice, go in and say the prayer, go in and confess the sin. Every year, every week, every month, the same old liturgy. There's no finality. Okay. There's no record anywhere where a priest could go in on the Day of Atonement and then he's done. He can sit down in there with God and commune. But what does the Bible say about Christ? That after he accomplished what he set out to do, after he accomplished purging the sins of the whole world, what does the Bible say? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, the work is done and this is what it takes to cleanse the conscience. Look at verse 9. Which was a figure for the time then present. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. That could not make him that did the service perfect. As pertaining to the conscience. 
I can only relate, and this is a strong relationship, if you ask me, to when I was a Catholic. We had masses, and services, and confessions, and penances. I mean, we were, we were into it, you know, and we were trying to get free. It never ended. You can never say you're Christian. You can't. In fact, the Council of Trent, anathema to say that you are justified by faith before God. Anathema on you. You don't know that until the end of your life. It's never over. Okay. There's no once and for all quality to it, just like with this temple. I mean, the parallels really are amazing. The book of Hebrews really, really was liberating to me when I first became a Christian. Okay. There's no end for the conscience when your sins are just covered. Besides that, what are you, what are you, what are your, what are your sins? Verse, verse 10, which stood only in meats, drinks, divers washings, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. He's saying there, no, but there will be a time. There will be a time of complete change. It won't be going on and on and on, walking around in circles, making services, liturgy. No, there will be a time where sin will be taken care of once and for all, and at its root, it'll be removed. And of course, if that time wasn't inaugurated by the death and resurrection of Jesus, then I don't know if there ever could be a time. Okay, that is a change, and that's what he's saying, and that's why there's no temple to this day, because the need for it's over. And think about it, guys. They were about ready to go back to it. They were about ready to go back to it. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Like I haven't described the tabernacle. And by the way, to me it's beautiful, man. If someone made a model of it like they're making Noah's Ark down there in Kentucky, if someone made a full-scale model, that would be so cool. If you tried to attribute anything spiritual to it, that would be deeply sinful, okay? Some of us saw a service at First Assembly of God where they reduplicated the altar of incense. Of course, it wasn't solid gold. And then they reduplicated the sacred recipe for the incense something god says that you will be damned if you do in exodus and then they call the congregation down and put the incense on a live altar i saw 700 people come under the power of a spirit but not the spirit of the holy god because the holy god is not blessing the tabernacle anymore there must have been some other spirits back in the toronto days and the pensacola days he came under a strange spirit. He says, Christ has come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, verse 11. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. See, Moses said, God gave me the pattern. I followed the pattern perfectly. That's what they were saying at First Assembly. If you get the pattern right, then God has to do it. Okay, well, you can't make God do anything. That's legalism to the nth degree. And of course it's cursed. But Moses did make the pattern because God commanded him to. And do not get one detail wrong. And he didn't. He got it all right. Okay. But, but what is a pattern? It's a copy. What's a copy of? The original. Oh, you mean there's a real tabernacle? Yep, in heaven. There's a real throne of God? Heaven is his throne. Yeah, there's a real altar? Oh, yeah. Christ didn't come to the earthly one. He went to the heavenly one. Remember when he was resurrected, he said to Mary, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my God and your God. He's going up into the... See, because if you touch the high priest on the Day of Atonement, that made him unfit to be able to offer the sacrifice. So no one could touch him. That would defile him. He ascended to heaven. And speaking of that, what about the sacrifice? It's so much better. Not by the blood of goats and calves. Okay, goats and calves are God-ordained sacrifices. Clean animals, and they actually give their life. And they're innocent. You know, an animal can't sin. An animal can't sin. Not even a Tasmanian devil. They cannot sin, okay? Because they don't have more, uh, moral conscience. They're not spiritual. They, they are, uh, they're just animal. So they can't sin, okay? Neither can they volunteer, so animals, that's why the animal sacrifice was valid. But neither can they volunteer to be a sacrifice. I, and I don't ever remember them asking the bulls of goats and calves 
if you want to be a sacrifice for Israel, okay. And rivers of blood flowed out of that temple. Rivers. Especially on feast days. Okay. No, they just were the God-ordained provision until the real came. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats and cows, but by his own blood. See, Jesus' blood. <laughs> Let us talk about this for a minute. Maybe this is the last thing we'll talk about tonight. Jesus' blood? First of all, completely voluntarily. Okay. <laughs> Someone did ask him. Who asked him? God did. We'll get into this next week in the, in the conversation between God and Christ in eternity, recorded in Psalm 40. God asked him to come and shed and become a human being and shed his blood to save man. Okay, so it's complete voluntary. No one takes my life, he says. I offer it. If you think about that, that alone, okay. Jesus' blood is voluntary. Jesus' blood, of course. I mean, this is the only human life ever lived. Completely pleasing to God. He didn't bring blood. like the, He brought himself, okay? He didn't go find a bull for himself because he never sinned. He just brought himself. If you think about the cross, really is, is the priest getting on the altar himself. And making offering. He says. That, see that's why the blood. Of Jesus. See the blood of bulls and goats could not cleanse your conscience. First of all the sin wasn't taken away. You knew it was there. God knew it was there. It was just covered. And second of all if it really could cleanse your conscience. You'd only have to do it once. You have to do it every year. Now, what's that mean? Every year you have to think about it again. Every year the people have to hold their breath. Every year the people have to wonder if they're saved. Every year the people have to hope that the high priest emerges and that God accepted the sacrifice. But this man, he doesn't come with the blood of goats and coal. He comes with his own blood and he enters into the real holy place. And it says in verse 12, he's obtained eternal redemption for us. And, and I can't stress this enough. He didn't just cover our sins. Redemption means Liberation by purchase. You owed God because you sinned. The debt you owed, you could not pay. You owed God hell. You should have gone to hell. Okay. You don't got the money. You don't have what it takes to pay. Even if you reform your life today, you could never do it. All right. This priest comes in. Not into an earthly sanctuary. He goes right to heaven. Goes into the holy place. What's he bring? A bull? No, himself. <laughs> the only life ever pleasing to God. And he offers it to God. I will purchase from damnation. Jamie, I will purchase from damnation. Dan, I'll purchase from damnation. Danielle and Jonna. Oh my gosh. He, he brings his blood. God says, yes, I accept. How do you know he accepted? He raised him from the dead. Jesus is alive. He says, Neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood he entered once. Oh, he doesn't have to do it next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. We hope that it works. No. There's a once and for all quality. He said, he obtained it. The word of God says he got it for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. So if you read the Old Testament, the Moses is sprinkle the people with blood. Sprinkle the book with blood. Sprinkle the altar with blood. Sprinkle the priest with blood. Look, that is just physical. That doesn't really touch the issue. It's physical, it's provisional, it's pictorial. Okay. The priest put blood on his ear, blood on his fingers, blood on his toe. In other words, May we listen holily. May we do holily. May we walk holily. May everything about us be holy. Should sanctify, but how could it if it's just the blood of bulls, goats, and calves? It's God ordained. It's a picture, but it can't really go to the conscience and eradicate 
See, because what is the conscience but knowledge that you have deeper than your mental knowledge? A knowledge that tells you, do you fall short of the glory of God? That you're not what you're supposed to be and that you have done things that you know good and well are wrong. That's what conscience is. Okay, this used to be the obsession of my life. I need a clean conscience. I wish I could start all over again. Well, shoot, I couldn't. I actually went to the church that had a lot of altar calls and answered all of them to try to get my conscience clean. But I knew, I got up knowing, how could an emotional experience in an altar cleanse you? I knew better. Then one day, he showed me the meaning of the cross. And listen, once you see the meaning of the cross, you know, you now have a knowledge, a deep knowledge, that yes, there are things that I've done that come between me and the holy God. Yes, there are things that I've done that are so wrong, but there's something effective that's actually been done about that. Not by me, but by someone qualified to do it. A priest who lived as a human being and never sinned and never displeased God and made himself the satisfaction offering. This is very, very deep stuff. This is where I'm going to close tonight with this, this verse 14 and then we can take this subject up next. But how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered up himself without spot to God. If goats, bulls, and lambs, because they were ordained by God, could actually make a, a priest ritually clean, and they would. Or a worshiper ritually clean again. And that was enough to get you by. But I never really went to the conscience. But he has a how much more argument. Look, now we're not dealing with goats. Now we're not dealing with involuntary sacrifices. Or amoral sacrifices. We're dealing with a moral being, a human being who volunteered his sinless life to, to just remove everything that you ever did or said or thought that came between you and God. You understand? And so learn verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself Without spot to God, how much more should that purge your conscience? Understand what purge means? Remove the barriers. I don't know of anything between me and God. Now I know of things that should come between me and God. But I don't know of anything that I've ever dead, said, done that was greater in its effect than what Jesus did for me. I got it. I got a clean conscience. There's nothing between me and God. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. And here it says, who offered himself through the spirit, not in a carnal building that's going to be destroyed in the heavenly sanctuary. Father, here I am. Don't hold that against them. Here I am. I took it. How much more shall that purge your conscience from dead works so that you can really serve, really worship the living God? And remember that little ceremony where they're all waiting for him to emerge? So they can say, oh, good. It's all accepted. Well, this uh, in the New Testament, it's a little different. You've got to make your commitment now and believe that what he did is enough. I'm not saying that he's not going to appear. See? Because he is. Look at verse 27, 28. He's appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment... So Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many. And unto them that look for him. See, he's appealing to the same ceremony. The congregation is waiting 
Well, I'm not waiting to exhale. I believe. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and that his sacrifice was sufficient. All I'm waiting for him to do is to appear the second time. This time not to do with sin, but to complete the salvation of our body and to judge the world in righteousness. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the believers, for everyone that came out tonight to hear your word. And I pray that you will breathe your breath of life on the word and that you will give each one through Jesus and his blood a clean conscience, a complete knowledge that something powerful and effective has been done to remove any barrier, anything that stands in between you and us. Lord, we don't deny sin. We believe in it. But we believe that your blood and the sacrifice you made is so much greater than the worst sin that you have purged everything that comes between the true believer and you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.